we begin today's study of Psalm 107 that I so delighted in reviewing this morning after days of preparation. I say days of preparation because it's also a longer psalm, 43 verses, and a rich psalm. You may recall from last week, Psalm 106 and Psalm 105 were sweeping histories retold of the Jewish people. 105, the grace of God. 106, the disgrace of the Israelites. Psalm 107 also talks about ups and downs. In that sense, it's also epic. But here, the focus is more universal. And the fifth book will be more universal in feel overall. It is in this fifth book that we have, those songs of celebration, Hallel. It's the, not that the Psalms don't have specific uses. We also have in the fifth book, the 15 Psalms of Ascent that were said on the 15 steps going up to the Temple Mount. But the tone is celebratory. The theme of Psalm 107 is that life has dangers. And there are four distinctive dangers described in Psalm 107. Wandering aimlessly in the desert. Being imprisoned, dungeon-like. Illness and a sailor at sea. And the rabbis will say in the Talmud, Brachot 54b, in discussing this psalm, that these four categories of danger become the four contexts for reciting a blessing of gratitude to God, Birchot HaGomel, for being saved by God. The structure of this psalm will have a reoccurring order. With each of these four dangers, there will be the statement, Ve'yitzaku el Adonai, so the wanderers in the desert, and they cried out to God in their straits, from their distress, God saved them. So all these four situations have that same verse, the people are endangered, they cry out to God, and then God responds, saves them, and then a reoccurring refrain for each of these four sections. Let them give thanks to Adonai for God's kindness and God's wonders for the children of mortals. And although those two verses will get repeated four times, and that's how you can punctuate the psalm. There's also variation. And I'll talk about that variation, both in the word they shouted out. There's two different ways that's written, as well as the expansions of giving thanks. But let me put up the psalm. And I look forward to sharing it with you. Let me give you the overview of just, you know, what to follow. Verses 1 to 3 is the introduction. Then part 2 is deliverance, is danger, deliverance, and gratitude. Verses 4 to 9 is the desert scenario. Verses 10 to 16 is prison. Verses 17 to 22 is illness versus 23 to 32. One of the longest sections is the challenge of sailors, which will be quoted in Moby Dick versus 20, this piece of the sailors. This will be a psalm that's identified with sailors. And the last section so, you know, A, B, and C, the final section is verses 33 to 43. That's the overview of God's transformative power 
and ultimately how God will enable a world of stability in contrast to all of this back and forth between danger and redemption. The over, you know, the, the, the underlying message is that God is all powerful, powerful, the ability to affect change, and that people get in trouble because of their sinfulness, their wrongdoings, their going astray, and that God, and here there's an element of theology, either pulls them out or enables them to emerge, depending on your theology, as either the all-powerful or the partner. But clearly there's the sense of God and God's word intertwined with a response to human sinfulness, enabling transformation. All right, this is a wonderful song, so allow yourself just to hear it as it flows. And I chose for the title from the last verse, Whoever is wise, let observe these matters. Give thanks to Adonai, for God is good. For eternal is God's kindness. Let them so say. The redeemed of Adonai, whom God redeemed from the hand of the foe, and from the lands gathered them out of the east and from the west, from the north and from the sea. They who wandered in the wilderness in a path of desolation, an inhabited city they did not find, hungry, also thirsty, their spirit within them fainting, and they cried out to Adonai in their straits. From their distress, God saved them, and God guided them in a straight path that they might go to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to Adonai for God's kindness, and God's wonders for the children of mortals. For God has sated the yearning spirit and the hungry spirit God has filled with goodness. Sitters in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and iron, for they rebelled against the words of Ale and the counsel of the Most High they scorned. And God sank their heart with hard labor. They stumbled and there was no helper. And they cried out to Adonai in their straits. For their distresses, God delivered them. God brought them out from darkness and the shadow of death. And their shackles, God severed. Let them give thanks to Adonai for God's kindness and God's wonders for the children of mortals. For God has broken the doors of bronze, and the bars of iron has torn asunder. Fools, because of their path of wrongdoing and from their iniquities, they were afflicted. All food their spirit loathed, and they reached to the gates of death. They cried out to Adonai in their straits, and from their distresses, God delivered them. God sent God's word and healed them and delivered them from their death bits. Let them give thanks to Adonai for God's kindness and for God's wonders for the children of mortals and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of God's works with joyful song. Descenders to the sea and ships, who do creative efforts in great waters. They have seen the works of Adonai and God's wonders in the deep. And God spoke and caused to stand a storm wind and lifted up its waves. They go up heavenward. They go down to the depths with trouble. Their spirit melts away. They reeled and staggered like a drunkard and all their wisdom was swallowed up. And they cried out to Adonai in their straits, and from their distresses, God brought them out. God stood a storm to whisper and stilling their waves. And they rejoiced, for they were quieted, and God led them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to Adonai for God's kindness and for God's wonders for the children of mortals. And let them raise God high in the people's assembly at a sitting of elders. Praise God. 
God turns rivers into a wilderness and springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into salt marsh because of the evil of its inhabitants. God turns wilderness into a pool of water and parched land into springs of water and settles there the hungry and establishes a city of habitation. And they sow fields and plant vineyards, which produce a fruitful harvest. God blesses them, and they are multiplied greatly, and their cattle God does not decrease. And they had been decreased and brought low by oppression, evil, and sorrow. God pours contempt upon nobles and makes them wander in a wasteland without a path. And God raises the needy from affliction and makes families like a flock. Let the upright see and rejoice, and all iniquity shut its mouth. Whoever is wise, let observe these matters and realize the kindness of Adonai. Quite a psalm, isn't it? A lot of ups and downs with, again, the key theme that people bring upon themselves their misfortune by going astray. You know this word here, fools. It's a very rare word in terms of the description of those who are ill. Verse 17. Avilim, fools. The Talmud, Sota 5a, Ibn Ezra will quote, which is that the Talmud says a person sins, a person sins because that person is overcome by foolishness. So a rare word, Sadia Gaon will interpret Evelim as the ill. Dahud, a more modern commentator, will claim a Semitic root for the enfeebled. But the classic understanding of this rare word, Evelim, is that those who become ill become ill due to their own foolishness, which leads them to sin and sin to punishment. And ultimately, it's only when they call out. So this word here, this reoccurring phrase, let me look at it now with you. I'm pacing. There's so much to say. But look at verse 6. Here's this first category. These are the people wandering in the desert aimlessly. They shout out, Vayitzaku. Now, that image of shouting out is identified with praying out. So here often translates as they cried out. Two ways in which that resonates all the more in this time close to Passover. Exodus 2.23 V'ya'anchu b'nei Yisrael min ha'avodah And the children of Israel groaned from under their labor. V'yizaku And they shouted out. They cried out. V'ta'al shav'atam el el Elohim, and their deliverance was raised toward God, min ha'avodah, from their labor. Now, what's interesting about that little verse is that here they're groaning under slavery, and they cry out. Interestingly, it does not say, as here in verse 6, that they cried out to Adonai. Here they just cried out. And their cries reached God. Here's another place where now also in Exodus 2, chapter 2, verse 23, note that the word for crying out is not like verse 6, meaning the yitz aku is verse 6. It's the first word and it's a tzaddik. In this psalm, there will be four crying outs. Verses 6 and 28 will have it as a tzaddik, and verses 13 and 19 will have it not as a tzaddik, but as Zion. So the verse I just read from the Bible was 
like verses 13 and 19, take a peek, where it's the Yizaku. See, it's a Zion as the third. I'll come back to this in a moment. And likewise, in verse 19, it's a Zion. And in the final one, verse 28, when they cry out the sailors, again, it goes back to being a Tzaddik. Okay, so wait, let me read you one more verse. And that is Exodus 14, 15. They're at the Sea of Reeds. And Moses is... People haven't walked into the water yet. And God says to Moses, Matitzakalai, why are you shouting out at me? Why are you crying out at me? Stop. And the rabbis will understand this as a midrash to say. God says to Moses, stop crying out. Stop praying. Take action. Get those people to walk into the water. Well, to pull this back together, the transformative rhythm of this psalm is that the people are in distress and they then cry out to God and God hears, here verse 6 is the first of those, and will respond. God hears our prayers is a key message of this psalm. God hears and responds. Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, in his commentary says that people will often fail to own their problem as their own. And only when they say, I have done wrong, this is AA, right? The Alcoholics Anonymous. I have hit the bottom. And then you cry out to the greater power. Only then can there be change. Now, on this word change here of the Ve'yitzaku and Ve'yizaku, the two different forms, some commentators like Radak, Rabbi David Kimchi, and the Zohar say that they're interchangeable. They don't read in much. But in contrast, the rabbis, um, other rabbis, particularly one named Malbim, who was 19th century Russia, he said, if you look carefully, the Yitzaku with the tzaddik are the cries in the open spaces. The tzaddik is a big um, letter. And the, so that's true here for the desert and for the ocean. But when they're in prison or when they are ill, they feel confined. And therefore, it's a Zion. Now, that may be reading in, but it's elegant and lovely. In that regard, a couple of comments on the order of these four distresses. The Talmud, as I noted, will do an analysis of 54b, saying these are the four categories of danger with which you say, Birchot HaGomel, the blessing for gratitude of redemption. And here in Psalm 107, they are understood by commentators as increasing level of danger. The most serious danger is being out in the ocean in the old days. You know, Yehuda Halevi was at the end of our last teaching, and Yehuda Halevi wrote a poem about the dangers of the sea. Some say on his way to Israel, and some say he drowned when his boat went down. That was uh, Irene Lancaster's comment last week, rather than getting stabbed when he got to Israel. Going out to see Moses Maimonides' brother who drowned in the ocean on his way to India. The sea was very dangerous. So the four scenarios here in Psalm 107 are understood as increasing danger. The Talmud, by the way, in 54b, will organize them a little bit differently. They will first have the story of the sea, then the desert, which they will say is the order of likelihood of being in that dangerous situation. But here it's increasing level of danger. The rabbis, as I note, will do a prayer. And here's a, a teaching 
I'm going to do, again, there's just so much to say, and I have an eye on the clock. Verse 30, and they rejoiced for they were quieted and, and led them to their desired haven. The code of Jewish law, the Shulchan Oruch, Orachayim 2.19.1, will point to verse 30 and say, you can only say that blessing of redemption once you reach your destination. You can't say it um, immediately after getting better. You have to get fully there. And they'll learn one other lesson about how to say Birchad Hagomel, and that is in verse 32, and let them raise God high in the people's assembly at a sitting of elders, praise God. They will say that to recite Birchad Hagomel, you need a minion of 10, at least two who are considered elders, the wise in that mix. So those are laws that is discussed, the, the last law, in the Talmud, in Brachot 54b. When was this psalm written? Well, of course, we don't know. Is it written about a historical moment or not? And I just want to share, because there was something that came together nicely in my preparation, and that is three different commentators of the 16th century, that's post-expulsion from Spain, and all of these people were touched by that expulsion. So this is the 1500s, who have three different understandings of this psalm. Moshe al -Sheikh, he lived, born in Turkey in 1508, would die in Sfat. He would say, this is a unpacking of the dangers of the journey from Egypt. Ibn Yahya, he lived in Portugal about the same time. He sees this psalm as a description of King David's challenges in life, and the captive, that's the ark. Sforno, 16th century, Italy, he said this is a psalm that is looking forward to the Messiah, to the Messianic era with the battles of Gog and Magog. So here are three enduringly important commentators of the 16th century from Turkey, from Portugal, from Italy. A reminder that Jews are dispersed throughout the world at that time and throughout Galut, who understand and attribute different historical moments to this psalm. But remarkably, this psalm is also understood universally. So, verse 11, as an example, For they rebelled against the words of El, and the counsel of the Most High they scorned. That is understood by Radak. What is the counsel of the Most High? That's God's counsel. And those are the universal teachings. Those are the mitzvot, Sheva mitzvot b'nei Noach, the seven laws of Noach, which is that for many, this psalm is universal. This is about God, not only in relation to Israel, but these are universal dangers. Wandering aimlessly in the desert, illness, imprisonment, the dangers of the sea, that even that phrase, Atzat Elyon, verse 11, the Council of the Most High, is understood by a medieval commentator, one of the central ones, Rabbi David Kimchi, as this is about universal dangers, not just Jewish history. Now, there's something very unusual in this psalm, and that is beginning with verse 23, you see these, these brackets, the Talmud will discuss them in Masechet Rosh Hashanah. They're called Nun Hafucha, backward nuns, the letter Nun. There are uh, seven of them, 23 to 28, six of them, 23 to 28, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and verse 40. Why? They're Masoretic annotations. The Talmud would say they are to designate, they only occur in the story of the ships. So some say 
that they are, like in the Talmud, to say that this is to say that not everybody is included in this miracle, that not all the sailors were saved. Robert Alter will say that this may indicate that for the scribes, the Masoretes, this was an insertion. Verses 23 to 28 and verse 40. It's not clear, but it's unusual, and therefore I point it out to you. Well, we only have three minutes, and I could say and will say much more about this, but with your guidance in terms of what you're curious about. But let me just go to the, um, to the other piece, and that is, I mentioned there are two different refrains in these four scenarios. Verse 6, and they cry out from the straits. Tsar, that's like Mitzrayim, a narrow place, their ruts, from their disgrace, distress, and God saves them. And then the other part of the refrain, and that's singing out words of thanks, though that can also be translated as praise, others translated as acclaim in verse 8. And the choice of translating Livne Adam the children of Adam, as some would just translate it as people, but I translated Adam as mortal. He's the first because of the sin in the Garden of Eden who will learn of his death. And the contrast is between our own vulnerabilities in life and God's eternality, God's enduring strength which brings us to the end. Like many Psalms, there is a contrast for God as the God of justice between the powerful and the weak. And so part of the punchline, this last section is how God can take and transform. Let's we'll start with verse 33. We had the image of the sailors. So verse 33 is the bridge to, you know, overall, the overview of God, and we start with water. That's kind of a bridge, right? We've been out at sea, we're still with water, but now it's water in the wilderness. And what you get is a back and forth. God's ability to transform rivers into wilderness, and then verse 35, wilderness into water. Parched, thirsty ground, back and forth. And that ultimately, God, this is the promise, will settle the hungry and establish cities of habitation, will allow two things, physical security of home and harvest and societal stability, where the needy will be settled and secure. And there is this bias throughout the Torah, the bias of God has extra concern for those who lack power, the ability to affect change, the needy. And so those who control the shots, the nobles, nidivim can often also be translated as the princesses, meaning those who have political clout. God will make them wander in a wasteland. And I looked up this morning the word tohu in my concordance, tohu vavohu, Genesis 1-2. That was the world unformed. And this is the only place this word appears in Psalms, tohu, from Genesis 1-2. It's a word that'll appear 20 times in Tanakh, and it's often used, for instance, in Isaiah 44-9. The makers of idols all work to no purpose. Mm -hmm. Tohu, to no purpose. So here I choose to translate it as wasteland, without a path. So back to the needy. The needy, they are afflicted. God will allow them to prosper. Their families will become like a flock, the ultimate blessing. And the upright will rejoice. And then all iniquity shut its mouth. That's an anthropomorphism. It's taking a quality and giving it aliveness. As if it's a independent force. And 
God's going to shut its mouth. No more sin. And again, that's poetic play with the concluding line, which is what is the theme of this psalm? Whoever is wise, mi chacham, v'yishmar ela, observe these, these matters. V'yit bonanu, and realize, understand, discern, chasdei Adonai, the kindness of Adonai. Here too, the word chasdei, some will understand as used as God's enduring mercy, well, translated as covenantal mercy of Adonai, but precisely because this psalm is more universal, I choose to translate it as simply kindness, which is the literal translation. And my preference of translation is to be as literal as I can, leaving ambiguities of what is interpretive possibilities. And um, this psalm, there's a lot of differences among translators as to tenses. There's some going back and forth. In sum, this is a psalm that acknowledges our power to choose, human capacity to choose, and human capacity to recognize and become wise, coupled with the reality of a dangerous world in which we, through our own lack of judgment, can place ourselves into places of danger. And I have, as I read this Psalm AA in my mind, in terms of allowing behavior to control our lives, and then sinking and needing to call out to God out of an act of humility, v'yitzhaku, and finding that when we hit bottom and call out with humility, owning our wrongdoing, we can be transformed by turning ourselves over to a higher power. And this, at the same time, is a psalm like much of our religious literature that does point to the future when the world will become a world that may be more just, more stable, and more responsive to the need for balance. With that, there's, again, much more to be said. Here's one thing. I can't help myself. Let's share one more interesting thing about this psalm. And that is, there is a ritual called kaparot, where you take a chicken on the eve of Yom Kippur and you swing it over your head and you say, let all my sins be on this chicken. And then the chicken gets slaughtered, given away, or sold. The money is it's sold and the money given to charity. But the rabbis will debate whether this is a, an act of paganism or not. Certain Sephardic rabbis like Ramban and Joseph Karo in the Shulchan Aruch reject this custom. In the Shulchan Aruch, there's a gloss to Joseph Karo, the Sephardic editor, and that's a man named Moshe Isserlis, who will say, this is a good practice. And likewise, Isaac Luria, the mystic in Sfat, will say this is a good practice. Here in Irvine, California, there was a lawsuit by our local Chabad about the right to shlach kaporis, that's in Yiddish, to throw the chicken over your head because the Humane Society was challenging them doing so because you're, you know, you're, you're using that chicken in a way that's cruel. It's not, an, it's not, so in Judaism, there's a debate over this custom, yet because of the mystical Rabbi Isaac Luria approved it. And here's why I'm telling you about shlach and kaporis. Before you take the chicken, in the traditional prayer that was put together, you quote this psalm, verses 10, 14, 17 to 21. You quote six verses, you know, sitters in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and iron. God brought them out from darkness and the shadow of death and their shackles God severed. So you recite as the main prayer parts of Psalm 107 coupled with two verses from Job. And I'm always fascinated by how 
in Psalms, verses will be extracted and used in other contexts. So because that prayer of Shlach and Kippur is in such a bizarre ritual, that's still mainstream, at least in Hasidic circles. Um, I'm just fascinated again by how this psalm has a central role. It's also, by the way, as I noted in my letter, it's the first um, reading that the modern Orthodox rabbis, when they put together the prayer for Israeli Independence Day, they began with Psalm 107, probably to say, because it's identified with Birchat Gomel, right? This is the prayer identified with the blessing of gratitude to God for overcoming danger that you only recite, as I noted, when you reach your destination. And so with Israeli Independence Day, we're celebrating having reached our destination of return to Israel, having overcome all kinds of dangers as a people, now in celebration. And so Psalm 107, an important psalm. Okay, a few minutes for some reactions. My friend Howard first and Kanner Shula and uh, an opportunity to build. Go ahead, Howard, unmute. Call a kavod, Rabbi. I love that part when Adonai says to Moses, stop. Yeah. Praying and crying, get, get going, get those people out. Yes. Reminds me of another old saying I've heard, before you go to pray, make sure you tie up your camel. Mm. And also there are so many times that we, we all get stuck in the desert. We all get stuck in the water and that at those times we need to take action. And this just reminded me, it's very much of a Jewish thing. I do believe enough already. What are you going to do to make it better? Or what are you going to do to make the world better? And one last comment, Ed Heyman's article was extraordinary. And thank you, Ed, thank you. <laughs> so just to react to Howard, so I have always loved that midrash on Moses at the Sea of Reeds, in which God says, Mati Tzakalai, why are you shouting out to me? And as the rabbis then continue, enough praying, time for action. And yet at the same time, this psalm, as an example, honors the importance of praying to, because before action can change, there has to be a sense of owning the need for change. And owning means I have to take action. And so all too often, you know, back to the Meghan Markle um, interview the other day, you know, her ability to own that she was in danger because of suicidal thought, to be able to express that is an action too, and an act of courage. And so sa'aku, as the rabbis understood it, is an action too, and an act of courage. Kanashula. Being a great lover of language, I was immediately struck by the vayitz aku with the tzadi and vayiz aku with the zayin. Yes. And I was reminded, first of all, words being the instrument of the poet, uh, there is also a difference in sound yes. between zoek and tzoek. By the way, in today's Hebrew, as aka is the word with a zayin is the word for a siren. That is what we call the siren that we hear on Yom Hazikaron and during the War of Independence. Every time there was an attack, it was as aka. So, I think what we need to also hear here, and I love the fact that the poet chose two different sounds here. The aka with the tzadi is explosive. It's more an explosion. It is a shout. It just explodes out. Za'aka is more a sustained, more moany thing that just goes on while you're suffering still. So I think there is a distinct difference in sound, which gives us a distinct difference in feel and maybe in intent wherever they appear. Thank you, Shula. A couple reactions. One is I always love your comments, and I also love that you bring the ear to what you experience. 
And what you also prompt, in addition to that beautiful ex explication on the difference is between the Yitz Aku and the Yiz Aku, is that here the Tzaddik is the outside and the inside. So here it begins with this expansive shouting out, and then that, if you will, the siren is in the middle, the two middle ones, which are the more sustained ones. So that I haven't seen commented on, and I'm honored to you make your comment to see, again, that two tzaddiks and then the zions in the middle. Irene, you had your hand up. Is that right? Yeah. Um, Go ahead, I, Irene, yeah, I, comment, and then I'll pull it together. Go ahead, Irene. I, I, I wanted to say about Herman Melville, um, that I've written about him. He came to my small seaside resort near Liverpool when Nathaniel Hawthorne was your consul, in, uh, the American consul in Liverpool. He'd just written Moby Dick. I've written about this. And then he went to Israel and wrote the longest English language prose poem in the American literature, literature called Clarell. And he loved my dunes opposite my house. Um, the second thing is, you're going to hate me. We don't all believe what Meghan Merkel said. I was afraid to come on today. And it's very easy to accuse people, um, you know, without any proof. Like we have been, no, seriously, we have been the butt as Jews of libels and slanders. And, um, I, you know, she didn't, they didn't mention any names. And it's very sad that it was in California. Um, I watched it myself because I have to write about it, but um, I'm not sure, you know, Prince Harry used to support a Nazi armbands and things, um, and it's a bit worrying. I'm sorry that I had to, as you brought it up, you know, I thought I had to say. Um, well, I, I, I welcome you saying it, Irene. It's really the privilege mm -hmm. of Zoom to be able to have you part of our gathering, not only for your mm -hmm. richness of literature that you shared in terms mm -hmm. of the Herman Melville um, little yeah. segment, but also to acknowledge, which I do with humility, that there are different kinds of seriousness with which accusations are taken, and that's to be mm -hmm. dealt with with great humility. So I thank you for that mm -hmm. as well. So let me pull this together and to say, in reference to Irene, with her little sharing about Herman Melville, Psalms, which we're now engaged with, I researched a little to try and find out where in Moby Dick. It's noted by Robert Alter and on Wikipedia, the um, fact that Herman Melville quotes Psalm 107. Um, I wanted to see where in the book he did. The only thing I gained by my little research on Moby Dick on Google this morning is that Psalm 18 and Psalm 107 are the two Psalms that are engaged by Melville using the King James Version. And I have a teacher, Peter Pitsley, who is going to come on as a guest a little ways ahead. He's the father of bibliodrama. He has a doctorate in literature. And he said he never read the Bible until after his PhD. He only knew the Bible from how it was quoted in literature. And he only sat down to read the Bible carefully at a later phase. He would later again become this um, remarkable teacher of entering into the Bible as one's own bibliodrama. But that's just to say, with Psalm 107, to pull it together, such a rich psalm of images, the ups and downs of the water, the drunken sailors drunk from being dizzy of going up and down in the stormy seas and losing all sense of um, direction. This is a rich psalm image-wise and a treat to share with you. With that, Ed Heyman, our beloved friend, um, a few words before we say Kaddish as to this morning marks, Ed, a, a completion of 30 days. For all but a child, 30 days ends morning. For a spouse, for a sibling, um, for one's own, ch uh, for a parent, uh, distinctly, um, only a child does a full year. But a 30 days is the first piece. Ed, any thoughts either about coming to 30 days or about the study of Psalms? Not so much about the coming of 30 days because it seems like it's, uh, it's, 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 it's come several times. 
because of the, the, the long period between the time that my dad passed and the time that we were able to actually bury him. So uh, th there was a week. So I, I've, I've been debating with myself whether my Shloshim, you know, ended earlier or not, although I've been pretending that it has. It has yeah, I'm sorry, I've been pretending that it has not. And I know from, uh, from, from my late wife's passing that I don't think that we ever fully get over mourning. I think that we're, we're always in touch with the people who've touched us and that uh, uh, there's, no, there's no date upon which that uh, those sentiments stop or that we move on. We move on. Um, <clears throat> that said, we're, not, we're no longer racked by it. But, um, from from today's teaching, I I, I, I read the the, the um, psalm yesterday. I was moved by your translation, Rabbi. Uh, today in its encounter, I'm a little bit adrift because uh, my dad has no place in it. Uh, my my father was not a person who either a believed necessarily strongly, uh, but by the same token, he was not. Uh, tormented in any particular way. Uh, although he lived in the desert for the last 30 years of his life, uh, 20 years of his life, I should say, in, in Sedona, uh, he loved being on the ocean and we never had any particular uh, uh, problems there. Uh, any prison that he may have been in was of his own mind and his own making. Uh, so, so it was not that he ever found himself at loose ends or at wit's end. Uh, and as a result, um, he he didn't he he didn't have any of those periods where where he was called upon to call upon God for his salvation. Um, it's it's a, it's an odd thing because not being a believer as he was not, uh, he was very much an ethical humanist. Uh, he was often described by by my friends growing up as the most Christian person that they'd ever met, even though he was Jewish. Uh, never really quite figured out how to parse that entirely other than to say that he was very kind, very open, very attentive, very listening uh, to them, at least, if, 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 if not in his moments to, to me or my brother or my mom. But I do know that um, he did have a saying that he resorted to frequently. Uh, especially um, in our daily phone calls when I ask him how things were, his quip was always, God is in heaven and all is right with the world. So although he was not practicing in any particular way or observant in any way, I do believe that he was aware of God's presence in that regard. And, and because he found himself in no affliction, um, and, and for the last, I mean, from the time that he left the East Coast and moved to Arizona with my mom, and even in the years after my mom passed, he was blissed out. He was very, very happy. If, if, if he was waiting for God to lead him to his haven, he found it. Uh, and and, and the, the, the house that he lived in, uh, the, the, the rooms that he dwelled in towards the end as his mobility got uh, more and more constrained were a sanctuary for him. They were not a prison. Every day I would call him, every day to tell me that of all of the houses that he and my mom had lived in during their 60 some odd years together, he could never remember exactly how many it was, although in the back of my mind, I was always doing the math and I never wanted to correct him on it. But for however long they were together, he was happiest at the end. Um, he faced his, his end, he was 96 years old. He, he knew what was coming. Uh, he did not shy away from it. He knew he was going to be with, with, uh, with, with his wife and his beloved. Uh, at the end, he wanted to stay in his house and not move into a home because he knew that that's where she was. And, and I, take, I take comfort in, in verse 43 at the very end, because right. I, 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 I'm going to pull this together. Yeah, I will. I flip it, I flip it on its back and say, whoever is wise, let them observe these matters and realize the kindness of Adonai. My father was never in distress. My father was in his haven. My father was in his safe place, his happy place. 
And for that, I'm grateful. And by contrast, the fact that he could have been tormented at the end, the fact that he could have been in distress, the fact that he wasn't, I think he was in God's hands, whether he knew it or not. And for that, you know, I praise God and I'm grateful for all of the miracles that he has shown us. And I hope that my father is happy with him. So. Those are beautiful words. I love that piece, all of it, but the piece of um, we are always in touch with those who touched us um, as a description. And I had the privilege to have met your dad, to know the extraordinary work that he did that touched on danger, and to know that even though he was not one who was imprisoned or in the high seas, he was one who lived a life that touched on danger and helped ensure safety for so many. And I, again, am glad that you could in this moment honor his legacy and the gift of his life ending in bliss. With that, we honor Mike Heyman as well as others. I invite you, if you have a, a person for whom you are saying Kaddish, to join together at this time. Yitkadal v'yitkadal shemei rabah v'alma dibra kirute v'yamlich lavute Bechaye Chon Uv Yome Chon Uv Chaye de Chol Beit Yisrael. Baagala Uv Yismat Ari Vibru Ame. Yehe Me Rabba Mevarach Leolam Ol Meo Maya. Yitbarach Vishtabach Vitbahar Vitromam Vit Nase. Vitadar Vitale Vitalal Shame de Kujab Rizu. Le'ela min kol birchata v'shirata, tush birchata v'nechemata, damiran v'yoma v'mruame. Yehei shlama raba min shemaya, v'chayim aleinu v'yokol Yisrael v'mruame. Ose shalom v'mruma hu ya'ase shalom, aleinu v'yokol Yisrael v'kol yoshvei tevel, Vimru, Amen. In two hours, I will be doing a public interview with Edgar Carrot, one of Israel's premier writers, a writer of very, very short stories. We're going to be looking at some of his stories on the pandemic and talking about this last year. Um, tomorrow, Psalm 108, a collage of two psalms creating something new. Um, it's a shorter psalm. Ed, Thank you for being our honoree today and for enabling us to honor your dad at Shloshim. To each of you, thank you. You put wind in my sails. Have a good day. Be yes.